Welcome everyone to our Singray webinar of the month uh, with Tom Bowl. This evening we will be talking about sandals and snow boots, photographing Norway and Easter Island using Singray filters. And we will cover a couple of different filters and techniques tonight. By way of introduction, before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about Tom. His career actually started with a degree in journalism. He has been shooting professionally for over 30 years. His work has taken him to seven continents and nearly 90 countries. He teaches workshops and seminars, um, and he actually enjoys teaching photography as much as shooting assignments. Uh, he produces a variety of images for editorial, commercial, and advertising clients. He is a regular contributor to numerous photography publications, uh, and he has a focus on adventure sports, portraits, and travel. He also has been named one of America's top visionaries by National Geographic Adventure and was called one of the best photo workshop leaders in the country by Photo District News. And with that, Tom, I will, um, I will let you go ahead and get started. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to share some new work tonight with everybody. Uh, earlier this year, I had a chance to go to a couple areas that were almost polar opposites, and um, I thought it would be a, a nice contrast in terms of technique, style, filters used um, from kind of the snowy Arctic to more of almost a tropical location. So, um, you can see tonight, I'm, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to talk about a few filters I've never even mentioned before um, that I've been using frequently. Um, so hopefully this will maybe be some new new information for some folks that I, I travel regularly with. So anyway, um, so I'm going to start this all off and let's just get the ball rolling. So the first place that I was going to talk about tonight is called Lofoten. Um, it's the Lofoten Islands in Norway, and if you can imagine a map of Norway and you have that Arctic coast that just kind of goes up, 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 um, Svalbard, way up north, you'll see a lot of talk about that recently, it's, it's way up north. Well, Lofoten is near the top of Norway, it's a little archipelago of islands, um, and it's just stunning. I don't know how else to say, I've been there multiple times, multiple different seasons, um, and it's at 68 degrees north. So if you've ever photographed in the Arctic, you know that that Arctic light kind of has that low angle to it. And especially in the winter, it just the sun pops up, it stays low on the horizon, just casts this amazing light. And then it dips back down. There's, there's not a lot of light that time of the year, but um, it makes for very interesting photography. So um, it also is a place you could never go to without filters. Uh, just saying, the way that the photography plays out there, um, I think it lends itself really nicely to filter use. So um, this is just a very typical scene. And I thought I would start things off here with one question I get all the time on workshops and you're photographing a landscape or maybe it's a portrait that could really be any number of subjects and you have that bright red sky, the flaming pinks up there, and then you have deeper shadows in your foreground, very similar to what you see in this photo here. And if you look at your histogram, you're gonna notice that the reds, where that bright red clouds are, that creates this huge clipping on your histogram. It goes right off the right side, so it's overexposed. So the challenge becomes, I wanna hold on to those reds, that's really important in my shot, but if I, reduce my exposure in camera, then my foreground is almost going dark to pitch black. So the way that I get around that is I use graduated ND filters, the Gale and Rawl variety. I literally have used these for, for as long as I can even remember. Um, and I just absolutely love the fact that with a very simple, I, it's a little rectangular filter. If you're not familiar with it, the top half is shaded, the lower half is clear. They come in different strengths and the gradation from shadow to clear can either be sharp, we call that a hard edge, or soft edge, which is better for mountain scenes because you don't have a straight horizon line. Um, on this image right here, I had that exact scenario. So very pink, bright clouds, super important for the photograph. Um, but if I look at my histogram, I know that I have a problem. Now, one other quick point on histograms, look in your camera, you're gonna notice that you have a white kind of overall cumulative histogram. We call that the luminance histogram. And then you, 
are going to have a way to set in the camera to show RGB, red, green, blue histogram. That is a more accurate way of showing you what's going on with your exposure. That cumulative histogram may not show that you're overexposed versus when you show an RGB histogram, as in this case, the red channel had gone right off the right side, so I knew it was overexposed. Put on that filter, kind of compresses the exposure a little bit, so there's less dynamic range. I'm bringing those highlights down, so everything is a little more even. I'm not going to have as much an issue, um, and everything works out just perfect in camera. So uh, the other question that often comes up with those grad NDs, sometimes I hand hold them. Sometimes I'll use that P mount holder that Sing Ray sells. It, you just screw it onto the front of your camera. Um, and it has a little bracket that you can slide that rectangular filter up and down. Um, it depends on if I'm, sometimes I, I'm more prepared <laughs> and other times I just have to grab it out of my pack and hold it up there. But anyway, that's, I wanted to start with this because um, I use grads all the time. I never leave the house without them. Um, I absolutely um, love using those in the field and I am much, you know, I'll, I'll just start off the whole chat with saying that uh, I call myself a, a front end shooter where you know, I, this is almost 40 years now that I've been doing this um, as, as a career. And it's always about, for me, getting it right in the camera. And so I use filters. I like to see in real time in the field what's going on and have it as close as I can get it um, to, to where I want to go with that. So I'm a Nikon shooter. You'll see that in the EXIF data down here. Um, a lot of these images are taken with a 24 to 72 8, a good landscape lens. Certainly, there's other, all the brands, there's so many great camera systems out there right now. That's, as you all know. Um, here's another one that I th would, thought I would, in that same vein, kind of keep going this direction. So we know that we have these bright red pinks, and those, those are bright hot spots. The same can be said for any kind of bright value in the shot. The eye is always going to what's brightest before what's dark. I mean, why do we vignette portraits or landscapes or wildlife? You darken those corners, it kind of creates that tunnel. It just draws you into the picture. Well, part of that is because it's brighter in the middle. You're trying to de-emphasize the corners. That's what vignetting is all about. Well, the same is really happening with this scene. Take a look at this picture. So this is a frozen lake over in Lofoten. Um, and by the way, if you're, if you're wondering just how cold it is at 68 degrees, um, it isn't that cold, believe it or not, because you're on the ocean. So it's 30s, 20s. Um, so that's that's chilly, but but we used to live in Alaska, and and cold in Alaska is 30 below, not not 30 above. So <laughs> the ocean helps keep it a little more mild, which makes it great for shooting. It's you're not dealing so much with just the elements. But with this image, I had this beautiful white mountainous background, but without any kind of filtration on it. The snow was very bright. I was going to have to once again set my exposure to try to make sure the sky or the mountains that is did not overexpose blow out so and also from just a purely graphic sense and wondering how a person was going to look and kind of go through this image i needed to tone that down because i didn't want the brightest part of the shot as the background. I wanted it more in the foreground. So I put on a three stop this time. So it's a little darker grad in D. And instead of having a soft transition, this was the hard edge variety. So line that up just perfect with the, the ground and the water back there. And that toned down the, the sky. It toned down, more importantly, the White Mountains. So that's going to redirect everybody into these graphic blue shapes that that's where, you know, that's where I wanted folks to go. Your eye's going to drift to the back eventually, but don't want to start there. Want folks to go right in. So a few other things just about this image, too. We all know that vertical images are inherently more dynamic. They have a little more tension more often than not than a horizontal image. Horizontal is just, just by way of being horizontal is absence of motion, tranquility. It's, it's more of a common graphic shape versus vertical. You're dealing with more vertical lines and narrower axis on the, on the bottom there. So it's, it's a little more dynamic, which I thought worked well with this particular shot. So anyway, so that's how we go through there. Um, one other thing too, that I would just put a side note, I've gotten this question frequently. Um, do I focus stack um, to try to get sharpness throughout the frame? Sure, I will do that occasionally, maybe shoot two or three pictures 
move my focus point through the image. Um, in this image, it's a single shot at F16. So I have really good depth of field. You can see it's basically sharp throughout the shot. Now we know that when we use those smaller aperture openings, diffraction, you lose, you lose a little bit of acuity in the corners. So there's always trade-offs here, um, but it, it just depends on the situation. I'll do both, but I, I'm not afraid to use F16, but I'm also knowing that there may be other ways to create a cleaner, tighter shot, um, just, just depending on what the situation is. Um, here's another, this is my favorite town in Lofoten. It's called Reina. It's, it's in the very end of the peninsula. It's just this colorful, beautiful Nordic fishing village. And I don't know what else I can say. Thousand foot granite spires coming right up out of the water. Um, you can see this civil twilight, these pink and blue tones. Uh, when you're at that really high latitude, uh, when the sun goes down, there's this moment after the sun set where those hues will change color before we lose more light. So you're still getting part of the atmosphere is still getting light, but not directly the ground in front of you, so to speak, the landscape. And it's just a gorgeous moment. The best place I've ever seen civil twilight in the U.S. is at White Sands. That gypsum sand just picks up the color from above. In this case, um, it just we had a perfectly clear evening. Um, so it made for a great shot. Now, once again, I'm looking at this scene. I'm on my tripod, have all the time in the world. The top half of this shot, mountain, the sky behind the mountains was much brighter than what was going on in the foreground and in the water. So it was just a simple two-stop, soft edge, grad ND, bring it down. It's going to allow those colors to saturate. Everything's a little more even here. I'm not going to have to do anything uh, funny with editing. It's just going to be a nice, clean shot. Um, and I'm just helping bring down those highlights a little bit in camera with that grad filter. And it just creates the pink tones to start to pop out um, when you when you bring down the glare and the just the, the luminous value. So everything is a little more in line. So um, that got to love that filter. Can't say enough about it. Um, so let's here's another one that I, I thought I'd throw out a few terms here that I come up with these things. I have way too much coffee in the morning. I get so excited. I go out there. I'm on some landscape shoot and I'm like, I'm going to call that this. Um, so we, we, we do a lot of slow motion photography with neutral density filters. So instead of a graduated ND, these are a full ND. So the entire filter, and, and I use their circular square on variety, um, you just screw them onto the front of your lens. It's dark glass. It reduces light entering the camera. I, I generally carry 5, 10, and 15 stop ND filters. And what happens is, each one of those allows me to shoot at slower and slower shutter speeds, which is going to transform the scene. It's going to do things to a picture that I could never do in the computer or it literally it's it's like eye candy to me because I, sometimes I don't even really know what's going to happen. You know, there's a little movement in the clouds or maybe there's a little movement in the water and then shoot it at four minutes see what happens. You may be shocked. So there's definitely a discovery element, I think, to using these NDs. You can kind of visualize where it's going to go, but you never really know. The thing that I think that we like about these, or at least I know that I do, is I have the ability now to change this ocean that's crashing right in front of me. I could shoot really fast, one one thousandth of a second, freeze the waves, every little droplet, you're going to see it. That's a lot of tension. Um, I think when you have that sharpness in the water, in addition to the rocks and the mountains in the background, to me, it's all uniform. And it's the, I think the eye struggles a little bit with that because it's sharp in the water, the rocks are there, the mountains are there, and it just kind of all blends together. But then you add a neutral density filter and let's try shooting at 20 seconds or one minute or who knows, you can actually you know, change your shutter speeds to change the effect. But what happens is that water takes on a softer, more texturized look, and yet it's surrounding these objects that are stationary. So there's this tension between sharpness and blur. And it also gives the eye a much easier pathway through the shot. So I, I know when we teach on our trips, I think a lot of folks are, are, they like that effect, but they're not sure why they like that effect. And I think it's the visual tension that's created between sharp and soft. 
Um, I love, I call it ethereal mystery. That was after way too many cups of coffee. I'm like, oh yeah, let's give this title to this effect. Um, and there is no right or wrong with the shutter speed you use and what the water actually looks like. It's a creative choice. What are you trying to do in the image? That's always the first question here. Um, another great thing uh, about these filters is I shoot mirrorless now. Uh, I, I like mirrorless, certainly DSLR, film, everything works. One of the things I like about mirrorless is the electronic viewfinder, the EVF. I can put on a 10 stop, very dark ND filter, and I can focus and do everything composed right through that. The EVF is brightening things up so I can actually see. If I had put that filter on my DSLR, it would be pitch black. I would have to set my focus, get my composition, get it all set up, then put on the filter. With mirrorless, it'll look right through the filter. So you don't have to do that anymore. That's that's a very nice thing. Um, more of the same kind of idea here. Another thing that these ND filters will do, let's see, the exposure on this is um, two minutes. So this is a two minute shot. If you have water, and when I say water, not necessarily crashing waves or say a stream or anything that's moving fast, just about, we're talking more about texture on the ocean, maybe it's waves, but it's distant waves. So it's a little more removed than up close and personal. That ND slow motion effect has another great aspect of that. It transforms big oceanscapes. You look out there in a scene, you'll see a little bit of white caps or maybe just a little texture out there because there's a little wind blowing. And then you shoot it two minutes or you shoot it four minutes and that glass is over, that long exposure completely will switch out what that ocean looks like or a lake or whatever the case may be. And once again, it's playing on that idea of I have this element in the shot that has a smooth tone to it, surrounded by jagged peaks and then bright orange color. There's a little movement in the clouds with this. So, you know, if there's one bit of advice I would give you guys, if you haven't ever tried ND filters, try them. I, I think you're going to be shocked at what they do. You're going to need a tripod. A cable release can be kind of nice because sometimes you have to use bulb. Um, some of the newer cameras will allow you to shoot 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. But if your camera only goes to 30 seconds and then goes to bulb, then just use a lock-in cable release. Watch your watch and figure out the exposure and, and go for it and see what happens. You're going to be shocked at how things transform. I, it's one of my favorite filters because it's you just never know what's coming around the next corner. Another example of that, but I threw this picture in here. When you're a travel photographer, if we shoot for an editorial spread or we, we work for tourism bureaus, they give you this big, long assignment list of things to do. You just don't wait on morning and evening light. You're out all day long. And one of the things that I like to talk about when, when we're teaching is utilizing the light, what the scene is. It doesn't matter what time of the day. Sure, we're not, we would love to be there at 5 a.m. for first light, but that's not going to happen. So what can we do with the light that we're given? This kind of scene that you see here, I call these postcard shots. They're a beautiful shot. It's absolutely in the middle of the day, and it's still going to make a nice shot. In fact, if you ever literally look at a postcard rack, all those things that people buy, more often than not, it's not the flaming red sunrise shots that people are buying off a postcard rack. They're buying the midday shots of the chapel, the mountain, the waterfall. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Don't let this idea that the, the light's not perfect. I'm not going to shoot. I look at it and say, the light's always perfect for something. I just have to figure out what it is. In this case, I did a four minute exposure with a 15 stop filter, a 15 stop ND filter, and it completely changed the texture on the ocean. That one little island in the middle just adds this complete eye grabbing component to it because it breaks that smooth pattern. It kind of adds that tension quality to it. And then there's a little bit of movement in the clouds in the upper part of the frame. This shot done at 1 25th or 1 500th of a second, it's pretty, but boy, put on an ND filter, shoot it for minutes. It's a completely different picture and something that you're going to be, I think, much more interested in. So the ideas on that. So we're going to switch gears. So we're going to leave Arctic Norway and we're going to go way south of the equator down to Chile, Santiago, and eventually over to Easter Island. 
I thought I'd start in Santiago, big, busy city, high, high city, um, very friendly people. The Andes are right in the background. Uh, my wife and I have been going down there for over 30 years guiding. We just, we love it down there, Argentina and Chile. We practically should just move down there. But um, anyway, so we were covering, walking around the city a little bit before the, the next day, we we're going to take our, our flight out to Easter Island. And we were just shooting cityscapes, travel photography, food, everything that comes with trying to set the tone for a new place and telling a story about it. One of the shots I love to do in any kind of city is panning with the locals. And that could be a rickshaw in Vietnam. It could be a little cab in downtown London, or in this case, it's a biker in the streets of Santiago. One thing that you find when you do this technique, so pan and blur, you're going to track the subject and try to stay steady and shoot so that they're slightly sharp. Hopefully a little piece of them are sharp and then the background goes blurry behind them. Well, the challenge becomes in the middle of the day, once again, we can't always be there when we want to be there in terms of the light. To shoot slow enough, you're going to need an ND. You need some kind of way to block light entering the camera so you can shoot at that quarter, eighth of a second, 15th or 30th, whatever the case may be. Even if you go to F22 and your lowest ISO, chances are you're not going to be slow enough. It'll depend. If you're in a shady area, maybe you can do it. If you're out in the bright sun in the middle of the day, it's going to be very difficult. So for these kind of situations, I use a five-stop ND filter. I, I call it my panning filter. Everywhere we go when we shoot travel, we always have a five-stop ready to go when we're trying to create some panning movement shots and we're in a bright light situation. You just can't do it any other way. You, you have to slow the shutter down. So look for colorful backgrounds, that's going to blur, and then your subject is hopefully going to be sharp. A big question does come up about that. Does the subject have to be tack sharp, or can he be sort of sharp? Or, and I think the answer to that is if you have a little piece that seems relatively sharp, I call that good. The other direction is everything's soft and it goes more abstract. There's no right or wrongs here, but I think when we have all this motion and movement, you can see that there's different planes of movement here between the biker and then the background and the neon lights, things that are closer, further away. All that is going to change as you pan and the movement is going to just be different relative to how far they are from the camera. I, you know, this is one that you just get out there, shoot a ton of photos, see how it works. You're going to shoot hundreds. Maybe you get a couple. I bet you I shot uh, easily four or 500 shots of bikers, joggers. There were some skateboarders. In fact, there was actually a road race this day running down the street. But this is the one I liked the best. And for me, it was mainly because of the background. We had some really interesting stripes on the road and some kind of neon lights behind them. That made for an interesting pan and blur shot. So Great thing to experiment, just pan with your subject, start at about a 30th of a second, and then you can go further down and, and see what happens, see what, what kind of shots you get. So then we leave and we jump over to East Island. It is, get this, a five hour airplane line from Santiago to East Island. They say it's one of the remotest inhabited islands in the world, and, and I can believe it. It's halfway between so it's basically halfway to Tahiti. If you just took off from Santiago and started flying that way, five hours, you see this little island, that's going to be Easter Island. And then you just keep going and eventually you're going to get over to Bora Bora and all those fun places. But it's an amazing place. Now, the curious thing for me with Easter Island is I had been there maybe a decade earlier, 12, 13 years. And th the one thing I remembered about the island was it was lost in time. Tourism just couldn't get there. It wasn't a cruise ship port. It was difficult to fly out there. There was literally like two coffee shops and like one hotel. And it was perfect. It was beautiful. They had these amazing Moy statues, which you're going to see here in a second. And the thing that really got me was you leave Santiago, which is Chile, Chile obviously. This island is governed by Chile, but it is all Polynesians or, or mainly Polynesians that inhabit it. They originally came from the Marquesas Islands, so they think. And so it has this huge Polynesian flavor. Well, I put this image in here 
mainly because it's a scene setter. So if you're trying to show that slideshow at home, or maybe you're going to do it to a photo club, anything like that, you need to give people a sense of place. There's the people, there's the landscapes, there's the food, all those things make a good travel portfolio. Um, we got off the plane, we went to our hotel, we barely got our suitcase out and they're like, hey, um, we're gonna go up and we're gonna shoot these dancers on the top of this dormant volcano. And so you're kind of in la la land, you just got off the plane, you're still jet lagged a little bit. Then you fly up to this thing and these people jump out and you're like, okay, whoa, hold on. Of course it's beautiful light and they're in traditional, uh, a dress and attire. So it was a striking thing. Now you got the craziest thing about this. I get so excited about this. So the male dancer in the shot, ready for this? Years ago, um, I had shot a guy dancing, doing kind of a ceremonial dance on some lava rocks um, in Easter Island. Same, same kind of idea here, except it was a little more towards sunset. I had no clue. Same guy. He, I swear he didn't age a day in his life. I looked at this guy and I'm like, oh no, I can't believe this. A decade ago, I was photographing the same guy. Had no idea. I hadn't stayed in touch with him. And here he is. Doing, he's still there and he didn't change. And I'm like, wow, I, you know, whatever the, is in the water down there, I, I need some of that. Um, filter wise on this shot, um, another question that we get a bunch is, do we use protective filters on the front of our lenses? And the answer is, generally so. A lot of times, yes, occasionally not. Now, I know that's kind of a qualified answer. Let me restate that by saying this. I have scratched the front elements on countless lenses. It is no fun when you're cleaning your front element and there's a nick there and it won't go away. The only way to fix that is to send it in and they have to change out the whole front element. Um, we travel hard. I do adventure sports. You're dangling on cliffs and doing things. So our gear gets beat up a lot. I like a protective filter for that reason. I would much rather have that take the punishment than my front element. Now, if I'm in a studio and I'm shooting a portrait, something like that, then chances are I'll just have the native glass with no filter on there. But when I travel and I'm throwing stuff in my camera bag or I'm dropping it on the ground or doing basically being hard on my gear, I'll have a protective filter on my lens because I don't want to scratch yet another, another element. So we went from that to the next day we had a statue. These are the Moy statues that were originally built way back in the day on this island. And it's fascinating to read about how they were transported and how they actually moved them from one place. And I'll show you a couple of pictures in a second from this quarry. Um, but we had the sunset of the century this night, and it, I got to use a filter that I love for ocean sunsets, and that's the Brian Hansel. It's the all-in-one graduated ND. Now, you're asking yourself, how does that filter differ from just the traditional graduated ND that's dark and just slowly gets brighter as it goes down? Well, this one, the top part of the filter is shaded. It gets darker towards the middle. And then it goes clear. Now, think about that a second. If you have an ocean sunset right at the horizon line, it's very bright, right where the sun is. But up on the top part where the higher sky, it isn't that bright. And certainly in the water, you don't need any kind of filtration. So that Brian Hansel filter, what's terrific about it is that softer darkening on the top, that dark band mid level is perfect for lining up with the sun. It gives you this super clean exposure. It's not dark where you don't want it dark. And I couldn't find a better example than this picture that we had this evening where we had that dark, or I'm sorry, bright horizon line, perfect alignment with that filter. And the top half just having a slow gradation of, of darkness and then the bottom half being clear. It just was like meant for the shot. So. Once again, what's it doing? It's controlling the highlights. This is bright sun. These, the red channel on this, on my histogram, was just going off the charts. So this filter really, really helped me bring down that and get the exposure in control a little bit. Um, I love this for ocean sunsets, this particular filter. It just works terrific. Um, another image, very similar. Uh, this, the, this is, we shot here for, I swear the sun hung in the sky for like two hours. It, at least that's what it felt like. Um, but you can see here, it's a little later in the evening. So the sun has come down a little bit more. But once again, that filter is doing its magic. Can't say enough great things about that. 
Uh, that is one, especially if you are shooting on oceanscapes. It works in mountains and, and other places as well. Um, I tend to find myself using it the most when I'm on oceans. Just, just love it. A um, few other things that I thought I would throw out there. Um, once here we have an oceanscape. So I'm thinking about what am I trying to say about Easter Island? It's this magical place. And there's these interesting Polynesian people. They have the Moy statues there. And so I'm going to photograph these crashing waves. And once again, it's not going to be a fast shutter speed. I want to slow it down a little bit. I use the five stop ND on this just to bring the exposure down to about a tenth of a second on this particular shot. That still leaves a fair bit of motion and texture in the image. Um, one other thing I would point out here is we have all these guidelines for framing a shot, the Fibonacci, the rule of thirds, uh, the golden triangle. They all are great ways to help give you just guidelines to frame your shot. The other way to look at that is just ask yourself, what's interesting? To me, it's all about the rocks and the ocean. I need to have the sky in this shot just to ground the image and kind of give it a sense of place, but I certainly don't need to follow the rule of thirds and show a third of the frame of gray sky that really doesn't have any interest in it. So break those guidelines anytime you feel like you need to, to show the viewer what you want to show the viewer. So in this case, I just stripped in the sky, just a little piece at the top. I really wanted people to look at the ocean, the water. It's that tension yet again between stationary and motion. That's what's really at play here. But I would, I would encourage everyone in the audience, a guiding principle for me is before you even take the photo, why am I taking this shot? What am I attracted to in the picture? And what camera craft, what technique can I do? What composition can I do to accentuate that, to really celebrate the part of the photo I like the most? Don't remember, you know, take your snapshots, just click, 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 but then slow down a second and say, okay, this is what I want to do with that shot. So we moved around the island. It's not a big island. You can drive around the whole thing easily in, in a half day, and there's not a lot of people out there. I can't remember the population, maybe 3,000, 4,000 folks, not, not much. And just so you know, not a lot. The people evidently don't age a whole lot out there, <laughs> um, nor does anything else change. There's maybe two more coffee shops, maybe a couple more hotels, but Easter Island has stayed relatively intact. It's still a marvelous place to go to. It's difficult to get there. Realize independent travelers just can't fly out there and, and hitch a ride into a hotel. You need to have it set up with a guide, where you're going to be, what hotel you're staying at. So it's a little more involved, but if you like culture and exotic places, this it doesn't get a whole lot more exotic than this. Um, this area that you're seeing in this photograph is the quarry. So the original inhabitants would go to these rock, rocky mountainsides, carve these moist statues out, and then just kind of inch them down the hillside to move them to different places. And they have a part of the island has a trail in this one protected, I think it's the UNESCO site. And you can weave right through these statues. The trail goes right below them. It's absolutely uh, breathtaking. I, you just, or you have to stand there and look and just say, wow, really? Um, so I was using the LB color polarizer on this. I love that warm polarizer that Singray puts out. It's perfect for scenes like this. It's gonna saturate colors, add a little contrast, cut out any glare in the scene. Um, it just, it was just the right fit for this shot um, perfectly. Uh, I also, the other thing on a graphic level with this, um, I, I love how this one statue is close and, and huge. I think another thing that we often maybe skirt around but don't really identify in our picture taking is the whole idea of scale and perspective and getting close to a face, an animal, a statue, obviously is gonna stretch it out relative to everything in the background. So it creates this nice curving line through the photograph. Another shot, same place. Um, this one is one of my favorites only because it feels like this one is just kind of coming out of the ground to say hello. Um, <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, but same ideas here. It's a color polarizer. Another thing that I would throw out to everyone in terms of your travel photography or photography in general is don't, don't have everything sharp. In fact, use selective focus. Remember, the eye goes to what's sharp 
for what's what's not sharp. So if I have my background statues sharp in this image, the eye's going to go back and forth, back and forth. But if I blur out the background, I'm really emphasizing this one statue that's lying in the grass. I'm telling you, this is more important. So if you if you can't decide in the field, then shoot at f11 or f8 and get everything sharp, and then try a shallower depth of field as well. I think that oftentimes you get more of an interesting effect if you use a little bit of selective focus on that. We did go out at night. Um, to, this is another famous location on the island. And because there are no lights out there, there is a little town with limited light. But areas like this have zero light pollution. You literally are in the middle of nowhere. So this is right at twilight. <clears throat> but you get a little bit of light coming in on the foreground statues mixed in with some stars and a really interesting textured sky. Uh, you know, these days we can all shoot at ISO 6400 or even higher. There's great ways to reduce noise. So getting an image like this, which at one point was very difficult to do, now is very possible. You may need to help it a little bit in the computer to reduce noise. Uh, but blue hour, as we call this, these twilight kind of shoulder times are is a great time to be out. A very different kind of light, obviously blue tones. I love the mix in an editorial story, go pick up a travel magazine. You're going to see the warm shots, the cafes, and then you're going to see blue hour. And editors and designers are saying warm tones, cool tones. They're trying to really mix it up to give you a journey on that story. So blue hour is effective on a lot of levels, one just being the color palette in general that, that it is. I did use a UV protective filter here. Uh, we had tons of heavy dew and moisture coming in from just the ocean. So I literally was wiping the front of my lens with my t-shirt. I know that's not good technique. Uh, maybe that's why I scratched the front of my lenses, uh, but I had that protective filter on there. I wasn't that stressed out about it. And I definitely had to do it between every single frame because it was getting tons of moisture on the front of the lens. So another reason that I like to use those filters. Few other shots here from Easter Island. Uh, this was uh, one of the few areas on the island that has a big palm forest. Love this spot. And I, I had shot here a decade earlier and I knew I wanted to, I, the original time I'd been here, I walked straight out to those statues near the beach and didn't get a palm tree in the shot. And I knew when I came back, I needed to emphasize the palm trees to give it that tropical feeling. So I backed way out, but I still held a sense of place because you see the moist statues. Use the same Elbridge color polarizer here. It was great at saturating the water, took off any sheen on the ocean, worked perfect. Uh, it was just the right filter. And I, I really like how this image came out. It was kind of a vendetta from a decade earlier where I, I knew I could do something that had more of a sense of place. I mean, the moist statues, obviously say Easter Island, but I wanted to add more of that warm tropical feeling. By the way, the island is just that. You can go swimming, it's warm, it's, 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 you know, it's not quite tropical, but almost so. All right, here's the last shot I have for you guys tonight. And I just wanted to throw this one in there. This is not Easter Island, this is not Lofoten. This was literally like two days ago, we were on the Oregon coast shooting seascapes and spires, things like that. And this idea came up and I thought I'd share it with you guys. It's similar to some previous concepts, but a little different. Once again, it's talking about moving water and we have ocean waves coming in and coming out. So, so far, everything I've talked about tonight, transforming that water has been more about a mood or just a sense. But another thing happens when you shoot at say a second, two seconds, because the water isn't cotton, it creates lines. It's going to have streaks in it. Well, another way to think about how fast or slow you photograph your water is, do you need a line to connect your foreground with your background? And this is a great example of that. We sat out there, there's 10 people, we're trying to photograph this scene. We tried all different exposures, 30 seconds, multiple minutes, down to about a second. And we like right around a second the most, mainly because it's connecting the foreground with the background. There's great texture and line created here that just pulls you through the shot. And that's a direct result of the shutter speed that you choose 
once again, this was a 10 stop uh, ND on here to get it to the to the level I needed it, it to be, you know, that shutter speed to create those kind of lines. So think about it from a mood sense, but also think about it from purely a graphic sense and how that might improve your image just by, on that level as well. So I think that is all I have for you guys. It looks so. I'll stop sharing here. Oh, there she is. I am. Uh, well, thank you very much for all of that. Um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and use the chat or the Q&A window. Um, we'll keep them open for a few minutes. One of the things that really struck me um, was the use of the word tension when you were talking about the vertical photos. And I thought for me, I'm a curious person and I feel like I'm not getting the full picture in a vertical photo. And I wanna know what's just off the frame. And what I really appreciated about your vertical photos is there was always something drifting my eye off frame, whether it was a chunk of ice or a rock, there was something compositionally that just made me even more so want to know what is out of frame, what am I missing? Yeah, you know, I, I would I would just add on to that advice for everybody that's out there. Any shot that you really like, shoot it horizontal and shoot it vertical. Um, that for me comes from just working with publications. They always want verticals for covers or things like that. But I have never gotten that out of my system that if I see just this amazing picture, I'm really excited about it. I'll do whatever makes sense, the horizontal or the vertical, and then I'll do the opposite just because you never know. Um, Roger wants to know, what's the difference between the LB color combo polarizer and the infused neutral polarizer? You know, I would say the warm tones are what strike me about it, um, that, that the newer infused polarizer, which we have and we love, by the way, um, it's a little more neutral. It's a little, I would say, bluer. The LB is definitely adding a warm tone to it. And I think your choice is, it's a creative choice as well as maybe where you're at in Easter Island, the LB was perfect. Everything felt like it wanted to be warmed up. It kind of had that tropical flair. But if I was, say, in Canyonlands or, say, Arches, where I already have a lot of red rock, maybe a neutral, the infused, is going to be a better choice there because it's going to keep colors. They're already warm. Maybe I don't need to make them warmer and just go that route. Do you have any thoughts on using the variable ND filter as opposed to the 5 or 10 stop? Yeah, you know, very NDs are, are terrific. A, a lot of folks love those, especially because they're that. Um, I, for me, I just, I, I like just a simple like five stop, 10 stop. Fit. It's like, I know exactly, here's what it, maybe maybe this is what it, how I can answer that. I've used the 5, 10, and 15 so long now that I just can look at the scene and I can know if I put a 10 stop on, I'm going to be roughly at a minute and a half at this aperture. And it's almost like it's just easier for me to conceptualize what I may get at those increments, 5, 10, and 15. Very Ds, people love those. It gives you the ability to brighten the scene folk if you're at, with a dslr it's terrific you can do everything and then darken twist that filter and darken the scene down i think it's really a personal choice i just tend to gravitate towards more constants than than the very and then kathy said i'm very new to using filters and didn't know the variety of filters that there are thank you for a great presentation for someone who's new to using filters, we talk a lot about ND filters. Is there a certain filter they should start with or any tips for yeah. newbies? Yeah, here's, here's the exact tip I would give you. Um, decide what lens you have that's your main landscape lens. For a lot of folks, it's a 24 to 70 or a 24 to 120, or it's kind of that range, slightly wide to the mid range. So figure out what that lens is for you. Look at how big the diameter is on the front. Is it a 77, an 82, a 68, whatever that is. And I would go buy a five stop, more slow Singray filter. The five stop is gonna allow you to slow things down. Um, it's not super aggressive like a 10 or a 15. And I actually think you'll use the five stop, ready for this? So you're gonna, you're gonna get that five stop ND. You're gonna shoot landscapes, streams, oceans, crashing waves, 
watch the clouds, all that stuff where you want a slower shutter speed, you'll have a ton of fun there. And then if you find if you go to Europe or you're traveling and you decide you want to pan and blur, like track that biker or the pedestrian down the street, you can put on that same five stop and it works in that situation. So it's it's very versatile. It does allow you to get some of those more uh, you know transformed landscapes with the slower shutter speeds and you can use it for travel such as pan and blur. That's great advice. I might I might go get me a five stop now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you use circular ND like the more slow and rectangular grads? Um, I, I think he's asking which do you use more based on your comments? Yeah, so I mean, I can tell you what I leave the house with. I don't go anywhere uh, without these filters in my pack. So I always have a polarizer. More often than not, it's the LB. Sometimes it's the infused. It just depends. But we'll have a polarizer of some variety. We always have a two and a three stop graduated ND filter. These are the Galen Rawl variety. And the two stop is generally a soft edge. The three stop is a hard edge. So polarizer, two grads, and then we'll have an ND filter or more. And this one, maybe sometimes I'll just take a five stop with me. Sometimes I won't want a 10 or a 15, just depending on the trip. Other times, if it's a really heavy landscape trip, or I know I'm going to go to a location that has a lot of moving components, I'll bring a 5, 10, and 15. Um, but I never leave without a polarizer, grad ND, and at least one kind of, of full ND filter. Circular on the NDs, rectangular on the grad NDs. Do you ever use the Singray blue and gold filter? Oh my gosh, man, that thing is wild. It, it, it's like a 60s filter. I mean, everything is purple and gold. It is really fun. Yes, we have that. Uh, we have a lot of fun with that in the fall. Like in Colorado out here, we get a lot of bright yellows and aspens or we go up to Jackson and it is fun. It, depending on which way you rotate it, it, you either enhance the golds or the blues. Another great time to use that is um, in the winter, if you have water, it, think about this, right? Winter, cold, blue, everything's kind of blue. So we will go find babbling brooks that are kind of half frozen and half not and use that golden blue. And you can make the water really blue or gold. It just seems for some reason it fits really well, I think, in a winter landscape. Certainly people use them all over. But yeah, we have those. We don't, we take it out for special occasions. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, when shooting with mountains in the foreground and you want to reduce the exposure of the sky, but keep the exposure on the mountain, how do you position the grad ND with the uneven edge of the mountain and sky? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question. The, the answer there is make sure that you have a soft edge ND filter. So a two-stop soft edge. So imagine a rectangular filter, darkest at the top, and then that slowly gets, uh, as that transition goes from full two stops to clear, there's a fair bit of filter there. So it's easy to hide that transition on a mountain. So um, you put it on there and you're, you're thinking, if you had a hard edge, you're going to see that line right across the mountain. But with a soft edge, Oftentimes you don't even really notice it just because the transition is so gradual, but that's, that is a really good question. Um, you know, you may run into a situation somewhere where that becomes more apparent, but um, I find, especially with a two stop, which isn't overly strong, that that transition, you generally don't even see it on a mountainscape. I have heard of photographers taking two graduated filters and sort of putting them on angles to each other. I popped a link in there. We actually, um, Singray has a, uh, the Randall J. Hodges Mountain View ND filter, and it actually has the graduation from ND to clear in the mountain shape. So you could go around a large enough mountain that way. There you go.
think that's it for our questions for tonight. Um, thank you, Tom, so much for being our presenter tonight. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, you have inspired me. I, I, I think a couple of these Q&As, the word fun came out of your mouth multiple times <laughs> and panning and golden blue filters. And I'm, I, I'm really inspired to go out and make some kind of artistic shots now. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always, it's, it's always fun to chat and just share ideas and see what, what's happening out there and, and see, you know, bring up new ideas, try to inspire different directions. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a great night.